because I was in GNO and women's ministry, we have to do the whole church for decorating. <laughs> and like, it just seemed like every party was like on our shoulders and um, everything. It's just a busy season, Christmas. It's nuts. And, um, and I was really not getting much from the Lord. But when I started praying and pressed in, sometimes you may feel like you're like, hitting a wall with God and you're not getting much, you need to separate yourself and like go into a, a wilderness place, like where no one is, because God needs some privacy with you. And I had to go get alone and the voices, I had to slow the voices down in your head. Do you ever like try and get quiet? And then you like think about all the things that, you know, people said, or you think about like all the things you need to be doing, or the things that you haven't done, or the things that that you didn't do well, and then you beat yourself up, and somehow you end up on this horrible place when you're alone with yourself. But I felt like the Lord was like, shh, silence that, Jess. Silence your, your thoughts, because I need you to press in to hear what I'm going to say for the women this year. And so I got alone, and I heard the Lord say, it's time for the church to be taught how to be the church. I thought it was funny that they were doing that on the Sunday night because I don't know what their plan is, but I already had my plan, okay? Somebody should talk to me. And so um, 1 Corinthians, we just went through Galatians. Galatians was a church, and it was written. It was beautiful. It helped us. It strengthened us. Did you guys enjoy Galatians last year? I thought Galatians was so timely for everything we were walking through last year. But the Lord wanted me to step into 1 Corinthians, and then we'll move into 2 Corinthians. I don't know, girls. I'm not making any promises where we'll end up. We're going to take our time with Jesus, okay? And we're going to allow him to minister to us. But I wanted to kind of set this up for you, and then we're going to go into something special today on this topic. I want to talk to you about the Corinthian church. Here's the Corinthian church. Boy, were they, they in a time and a season like it sounds like we're in now. And it's funny how the Bible is relevant to wherever we find ourselves. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, the Bible says. There's nothing that is shocking to God. There, you know, we, it might be shocking to us, but he's not shocked by it. It's happened before, believe it or not. And here is the church, and Paul is writing to the church. And, in fact, he writes his first letter, gets lost, and so he goes to write a second letter. He gets a message from Chloe's church. Don't tell me women are not supposed to preach when Chloe has her own church. I'm just saying that. Just going to say that right now. So here's Chloe's church. They're all fighting. They're all going at each other. That doesn't happen here, right? Never. Never. And so they're divisive. And Chloe's writing, and she's like, hey, come help out. Like, we got some issues. And then somebody else writes and says to him, hey, we, these are, this is what's happening in the church in Gor Corinth. And so before Timothy gets there, Paul's like, I got to write them a letter and straighten them out. And I love that Paul writes his letter for all of us to read because if you read 1 Corinthians, you're going, that's us right now. Oh, that's us right now. Oh, that's the church right now. That is still an issue. And so we're going to learn a lot from this. We're going to learn how to be the church. We're going to learn how to step into our positions. It is going to be a place that will challenge you this year. You will be challenged in your faith. You will be challenged in your personality. You will be challenged in the character, your fleshly character versus your spiritual character. God is going to rock us. So just get ready, girls. You ready to be rocked by God? And in this, I wanted to give a little background. Here we are in Corinth. Corinth was a big city. It was a town that the east and the west had trade coming back and forth. And so it was a trade town. So guess what happens in a trade town? A lot of big junky stuff. Prostitution, idol worship, there was sex slavery. There was all this stuff is happening because it's a busy, hustling, bustling town. If you guys want to go ahead and collect the offering right now, go ahead. And... Um, and so it's hustling and it's bustling. And here it is, Paul's going, there's a church there, though. There are people in the midst of all of this, and they need to be reminded who they are in the midst of the dark places. They need to be reminded that they can stand even when things are really bad around them. Does that sound like us in California? I mean, you were the ones that didn't run. Let me just say, well done for not running out of California. Because somebody has to stay. 
Somebody has to pray. Somebody has to believe God. Somebody has to stand in the gap when the world around us is saying everything opposing to what the word of God says. God builds himself a church and a people that are courageous and strong and fighters and know who their God is and know who they are in their God. And so that is what God is doing with the Corinth church. He's building them up. He's reminding them, hey, don't let secretarianism get into you. Did I say that right? Sectarianism. Me and mom, mom knows how to say the word right. I say it wrong every time. So just laugh at me when I do. And, you know, the secular parts, the carnal parts of this world gets into the church. But girls, we are going to do our best to remove the carnal parts of ourselves and the church. And we're going to step into the spirit and we're going to be more like Christ every single day. And that our flesh is going to have to die to the places that are comfortable. And we're going to step into the places that God's asking us to go. And so that's what this letter is. It's a challenge. And as I was reading through the letter, there were so many good things, but I just kept going back to what Pastor Dan had, had given the vision of. You know, this is the year of love. And I just want to talk for a second about the year of peace that just happened. I have to tell you, the year of peace was a challenging year. Was it challenging for anyone else? Did you have to learn how to find peace in the midst of chaos? Yeah, I have a feeling we're going to have to learn how to love in the midst of, like, not wanting to. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be challenged. But this is the year of love. But yet, the, just like in the year of peace, when you press in and you find the power of God in it, and you come under the submission of the Holy Spirit, you're going to learn a strength that you never knew you had. And so we're stepping into the year of love. And I am learning so much. I, I, I Just right now, I will let you know, Pastor Jess stinks at loving. And I am working on it every day. But I, I tell you, boy, when you put yourself in a mirror and you go, well, that wasn't very nice. And you mm, look at you. You know what's really in your heart. Yeah, they think you were being nice, but you were like, you're stupid. And I have <laughs> those inner thoughts, right? Sometimes they come out with me. You'll always know where I'm at. But there's other people that do that very kindly. But you know they're like, you know what they're really thinking inside. And the reality is we got to learn how to take our flesh and we've got to learn how to step into the spirit and deny our flesh. And I believe this is going to be a surgical process for all of us. I know that God wants to kind of cut things out and put things in the way they need to be. And God wants to undo you to sew you back up. So I'm sorry I'm not opening with like, yay, love. I have a feeling it's going to be, yay, I love you so much, God, so I'll let you. Yay, because you did, I know I can. You see, love is not something that just comes. It's something we have to choose to do. And so as I was going through 1 Corinthians, um, I, I got to meet with my mom and dad, and I thought that was so fun. I went over to their house, and I was like, okay, I just want to make sure I'm going in the right direction with this. I know you guys have read this stuff a million gazillion times, and you're so full of wisdom. And we really were talking, and I was already leaning in the area of starting the whole book in 1 Corinthians 13, and then they confirmed it. They both were like, you should start in 1 Corinthians 13. And then loving their conversation back and forth. It's so fun. It's like coffee with the cobras, but hilarious. And... Um, and so they confirmed in my spirit that we're going to start 1 Corinthians in, 13, in chapter 13. And then it's like a wheel. I wish I could. I, I need to draw this for you guys, but I'm not a good drawler. So um, think of a wheel. It's going to be the spoke. Uh, it's going to be the center of a wheel, love. And then every topic for the church in 1 Corinthians out of that will be a spoke. It'll be division. It'll be all the different things that he deals with. Um, in it. And so you're going to learn all of these things in light of love. So we're going to learn these things because of love. We're going to learn these things because we know what God says and in the mirror and in the eyes of love. And it's so interesting that the Lord is doing it this way because I have an incredible son. He's my middle child. I relate with him the most because he's the most like me. And I completely get him. Do you have a child like that? I'm not saying he's my favorite. I'm just saying they're all my favorite. I always tell them whoever does the most around the house is my favorite that day. And <laughs> so bribing them, so bribing them. And so, but anyway, so he has this personality that is completely Cobra. I mean, I know his last name is Roth, but he's a Cobra. And the anger issues, the things that we all have to struggle through and put 
to, to the, you know, the ground and let die and let God raise us up because I totally get it. And, you know, that thought process that we go through inside and, and shut up, shut us up as just don't say it out loud. You don't, nobody needs to know what you're thinking right now. This is my son, okay? And so as he's getting older into these teen years, I have to tell you, we're living in 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm like, but is that long-suffering? Is, was that patient? Was that kind? No, Mom, they're stupid. And I'm like, yes. It doesn't say do it because they're not stupid. It just says that this is what you're supposed to do. And he's like, okay, fine. And usually it's his siblings that he, we're talking about. <laughs> and so as I talk to my son about different life issues right now because he's, you know, at that very pivotal stage or my daughter who's stepping into adulthood literally next week and uh, she's going to be 18 and going off to college and the transitions of life, I realize these verses are so pivotal at every single stage of our lives because as I'm talking to them about it, I'm talking to me about it. And as, as I'm telling them, I'm like, ooh, Jess, you didn't do that well. And so this is going to be a mirror in our lives that we're going to have to get better at. I'm going to tell one last story. All of you volunteers already know it. But I'm going to tell the, tell the team because I believe this, is a, this was a word for not just me and Dan, but I think it's a word for everyone. Dan and I, were is our New Year's, um, we were going to bed New Year's Eve, and we were kind of at each other. Have you guys ever been there? You know, Dan and I don't really scream, yell, and fight, but we, we just get really annoyed with each other. And so... I was like, mm, 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 feisty, feisty. He was working like crazy. I was working like crazy. We had not had any downtime. And so I would say to him, apparently, at 1130 at night, if you know me, I'm not a night person at all. And so if you're texting me at night, good luck. I don't know what I said to you. So so, um, so he says he, he, I guess he said we were talking. I don't remember. I must have passed out. So he's like, uh, all you said, Jess, was, Dan, you just need to do better next year. You just need to do better in 2023. And I must have knocked out. And I'm like, so I wake up in the morning, and he starts laughing next to me. And I'm like, Happy New Year, babe. He's like, yep, the last thing I heard on the last day of last year was, do better, Dan. Do better next year. <laughs> And I was like, I did not say that. And he's like, you did. You said that. And I was like, oh, gosh. And I cut, we laughed. And then, like, the rest of this, that week was like, he's doing the dishes. He's like, is this doing better? Am I doing better? And I'm like, <laughs> he's, like, putting his phone down when I'm actually having a conversation with him. And I'm like, you, you did better. You're doing better. You put your phone down. Like, <laughs> stupid little things that you know you talk about in marriage. But. The reality is, is that I felt like that was a word for all of us because it could be looked at as like Dan wasn't doing a good job. He was. He's the most amazing husband ever. But the reality is all of us can do better in 2023. And I believe that that is a word from God for all of us. And I brought it to my staff. I didn't brought it to the volunteers. I want to bring it to you. What can you grow in this year? How can you do better? How can you be better as a wife? How can you be better as a mom? How can you be better as a daughter of God? How can you be better in your Christian walk? How can you be better in your prayer life? How, what does God want to do in you? What does he want you to strive for? What places does he want you to go to that would be better than where you're living now? And that place of consistency, that place of stuck, that place place of comfortable, God wants to remove because he has better things for you. He has better places for you and he wants to take you further and farther this year. And so I believe 2023, you're going to do better by learning the love of God. And I believe that out of this uh, this understanding and these teachings is going to come a revival in our church. That's what I heard from the Lord, that he's going to bring a revival to the people. Because once we get love, once we have uh, an exchange for our flesh and, and, and the hurt and the pain, all those things that come with it, then when we replace it with the love of God, something ignites inside of us and we become new creations in Christ Jesus. And so I believe you're going to know a different woman this year by the end of the year if you press in and you stay in and you do what the word requires of you to do. And so let's all do better this year. Can we all do better in 2023? All right, I'm going to ask my team to come up. Let's ask the teaching team to come up because we actually are going to start you off with a panel about 1 Corinthians 13. 
And so we're going to start with the panel. We know you guys love them, and I have the best teaching team in the world. Um, and Pastor Deborah next week is going to open up 1 Corinthians 13. And so she was so good at it. I was like, you got the first one, lady. And she's in town. So I like to get her when she's around. So she will be, not next week, the week after, the ninth. Pastor Deborah will be here, and she will be opening up. But we are going to talk about some hard-hitting issues and some cultural things in our panel. So I um, get ready, take notes, but I'm going to give you your verse that you guys are going to put into your soap, okay? And they'll put it up on the screen. It is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. That will be your soap scripture, okay? And then we are going to get into it. Let me introduce everybody in case you don't know. This is Reverend Dr. <laughs> Vanessa Reynolds, and she is just so amazing. When this woman teaches, I'm always like, oh, my gosh, I got so much from that. How in the world did you break that down? She is, she is an actual medical doctor, but she's also a reverend on our staff, and she is just a wonderful part of our team. We love her deeply. She's a mom of how many... Five, and how many grandkids? Fifth is on the way. Jenna is ready to pop. <laughs> and so, um, and her children's age ranges like vary from 34 to 15 years old. And so um, there's so many stories within that. And so the wisdom she can bring to the table is just such a gift. And so Dr. V, thank you for being with us. We love you. And then we have Pastor Joanna. You might know Pastor Joanna, especially if you've taken Breaking Free. Pastor Joanna is just beautiful. I mean, there's just nobody more kind than Pastor Joanna. When I'm with Pastor Joanna and Tracy, I feel like the most bad person in the world. Like, <laughs> she's seen me at my worst, and she's always like, okay, but remember. And I'm like, I don't want to remember that right now. Like, I want to be mad. <laughs> And Pastor Joanna brings such a grace and a wisdom to, from the Word of God. And she has, oh my gosh, how many grandbabies now? Three, Three grandbabies. And she, and Pastor Joel, one and one on the way, one on the way. And over there, yes, Geneva. Woohoo! And, um, and you guys probably know um, uh, Julia. So Julia is, runs this woman's ministry. And there she is. Hi, Jules. She's still on maternity leave until next week. Okay, so I'm not talking to her about business. But she had a baby, and um, she's been wonderful. Pastor Joanna and Joelle lead our restoration ministry here at The Rock. And so they, there's nothing shocking to them. They've been through it all. They've seen it all. And, and they, the love of God just flows through Pastor Joanna. So when she speaks, you're going to love it. She's going to bring you a wisdom. And then Pastor Sue. Pastor Sue is just... She's our anchor, man. She's like, Pastor Sue, like, you could be flipping out. Pastor Sue's going to be like, okay, all right, let's just get you through that. And the, <laughs> and the cool thing is that she can have her, her moments too. And, and we, I love how Pastor Sue brings a depth and a love for the word of God and brings a wisdom on, the, on how God breaks down the word. Like, if I have a theological question, I get asked Pastor Sue, and she's going to be like, okay, let me break this down for you, or this is what I'm getting from this. And, and we speak a similar language because we both went to the same Bible college, and so there's just something there for us. Like, we speak Raymondite. And so, <laughs> and um, anyways, I love you, Pastor Sue. Pastor Mike and Sue are... Um, they are grandparents, and nobody's in the house anymore. They're all grown adults. <laughs> and so she's in a season of life that we all are learning from. I have lots of menopause questions for you, Pastor Sue. And, <laughs> and Pastor Tracy, we just love Pastor Tracy. She is over La Roca. They are the lead pastors over La Roca. And we love La Roca. We love you guys. And so we are excited about what God is doing in the women. And But Pastor Tracy is gifted in when she sings. There is just an anointing that comes out of her. It's a gift that God has given her. and But then it, her teaching gift has been so developed in these past few years. And every time she steps into a pulpit, I'm like, Oh, man, that was so good. And so, girls, I think you have the best teaching team here. You have Pastor Deborah next week, and she's just phenomenal. And so, guys, 
Pastor Nicole's not here. She's our hyper crazy one, and we absolutely love her. Yes. <laughs> Nicole puts us all to bed with energy. And, um, but she is at a conference right now getting trained up for your teenagers. And so she's feel, she loves your teenagers, but she loves the women in the house. And every time Nicole brings a word, she's a gift to this house. And so I think I've covered the teaching team. I, I don't know. Okay, but that's who will be leading you this year, okay, with the teaching team. Um, and so I wanted to ask you guys, since we're talking talking about love, we, we kind of got to talk through some questions, and then I thought of some questions about, like, some hard, hard questions, things that people don't want to address. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. V. Okay. Uh-huh. How do you approach confrontation in a healthy way and not talk yourself out of doing it? Ooh. Yeah. So I get the hard <laughs> question to start us all off as we learn how to die to our flesh. Okay. Well, you know, the Bible says that we need to confront. And in Matthew 18, it says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. And if the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. And if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. And if you won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. So it's clear what needs to be done. That verse is, you know, sometimes we got to go to the Greek and try to understand it, but that's pretty clear that we need to go to the person privately. We don't go to all of our friends and tell them, like, how hurt we are that this happened and what do you think about what they did to me. We don't talk about them behind their back. We are to go and approach them, right? So why don't we want to do it? I mean, we avoid this like the plague, right? Confrontation is hard, Amen. Because we want to be liked. We fear being rejected. We fear being misunderstood. And we're just afraid to, and we don't want to crucify the flesh. The flesh is saying, you know, they hurt you, and they need to be the one to come and say something, and I'm not going to be the one to go to them. They need to come to me. And, you know, the flesh just speaks to you. Have you heard the flesh loudly, you know? And um, we have to pray. We have to ask God that, so that we can speak the truth in love. And um, sometimes we think, oh, it'll just go away by itself, but it won't. You know what happens is that you distance yourself, you start getting more and more insecure, and you start putting up walls because that person hurts you and you have not yet dealt with it. And um, the Bible tells us three reasons why we need to resolve conflict. The first is so that our fellowship with God won't be blocked. Okay, the Bible says in First John, how can we love people if we don't love people that we can see? How can we love God who we can't see? How many in here are here because they want to get closer to God? Right. So we have to do this hard thing. We have to kill that flesh and we have to confront and resolve. The second is so our prayers won't be blocked. I love the verse in First Peter. It talks about it's about marriage, but it says. Treat your wife as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Okay? And then in Psalm 66, it says, If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So so our fellowship with God won't be blocked, so that our prayers won't be blocked, and for our own happiness. Because in James it says, Peacemakers plant seeds of peace, and they reap a harvest of righteousness. So we want to reap the righteousness. But we don't actually want to sow, you know, and it's all about sowing and reaping through the whole Bible. Amen. So my my verse on this subject is Matthew 5, 9, that God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And it says you have to work for peace. You have to take the initiative. That's not a gift. You do it. (laughs) Okay. And um, we, we are raised saying things like, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Have you ever heard that? That's wrong advice. It teaches us to, you know, being a peacemaker is not avoiding the subject. A lot of us think that we're peacemakers and we never address it. I do that. And it's not just appeasing that person, which is like agreeing with everything they say just to avoid strife. Like they say something that you totally disagree with and you're just like, yeah, you're right. Just because... 
it's easier. That's not being a peacemaker. Amen? So the, before you go to address them, there are two things that you have to realize. And this is why I always talk myself, myself out of resolving conflict. Okay? And I know you don't do this. But the first is self-centeredness. Okay? So I'm like, okay, am I being selfish? Am I, and the second is pride. Okay? I'm like, okay, so why did, was I so offended by that? Is it me? You know, was I just being prideful? Am I thinking just of myself? Um, you know, I looked at, um, there, there are certain triggers that trigger us sometimes. You know, if you grew up where you never got any recognition or anything, and somebody says something where they don't recognize you, and it's a trigger, you know, that will cause you to be offended. And we have to, we don't see these things in ourselves. It's up to close friends to point them out to us. Like, you know, every time this happens, you kind of get a little testy, you know? Did you see that movie, um, Back to the Future, with um, George McFly? And he, every time somebody says, are you chicken? And then he's like ready to fight, right? And these are like triggers in our life that cause us to feel offended. It's not so much what they said. It's what you grew up this way and so that's a trigger for you so I check myself you know is that a trigger am I being self-centered is this all about me is this about my pride you know that kind of thing and then the last thing I want to point out is this verse in in Philippians 2 verse 4 it says don't look out for your own interests but take an interest in others because we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had and that just says to us that we need to seek to understand others before we seek to be understood. Seek to understand others before we seek to be understood. And in reading about this, that word look, don't look out for your own interests. It's from the Greek word scopas, okay, like we say the microscope or the telescope that looks very closely and intricately at what's going on. And so before we go to confront somebody, we have to look in ourselves and look at them and say, you know, why did they do this? You know, people have triggers as well. And we have to look at, you know, you know, hurting people hurt people, right? Maybe if I was raised with a a dad that was raping me every night or with no food or in these horrible situations, maybe I would have acted that same way. Only by the grace of God am I aware I am today. So we have to kind of look at them before we approach as well, right? Because Jesus was lied on, cheated on, you know, talked about. He was physically hurt. He was rejected. And then we crucified him, and he reconciled his relationship with us. And so we, as followers of Jesus, it says, have the same attitude that Jesus had. He reconciled himself with us when we did not deserve it. Amen? And now, because of what he did on that cross, we have eternal life, we have peace, we have joy, we have happiness because of what he did. And we have to reconcile ourselves with our, the person that we feel um, has offended us. Amen? So check your heart. Is there any self-centeredness or pride? Um, and ask yourself, why am I going to confront? And this is where I also, usually I wind up not confronting because I, I stop like, yeah, it's me. No. <laughs> you know, but you have to say, you know, am I, do I want to go there because I want to shame them? Do I want them to feel bad because of what they did to me? Do I want them to pity me because of how badly they hurt me? Am I looking for that? Am I in unforgiveness? And I feel like if they apologize to me, that will take away my unforgiveness? Or do I have to get my unforgiveness from my heart and go to God? You know? So the reasons that I do confront is if I have a relationship that I love that person, but they're maybe manipulating me sometimes, bullying me sometimes. You know, I remember I had, I had, I still have a friend that would always, when we go shopping, she would always make me feel less than, you know. I'd say, oh, this is cute. And she'd be like, oh, it's polyester, cheap, come over here, you know. And I, and I began to feel like I can't pick clothes, that I have no taste, this kind of thing, you know. And you have to go to that friend, I mean, and in love, 
wrapping in love, the burrito of love. We're going to talk about that in a minute, you know, and pray about God's timing. You know, just because you feel like now is the time I'm going to get this off my chest does not mean that's the time. Amen? Amen. Sometimes you just get fed up and you're like, I'm about to tell her right now. And, the, and that's not the right attitude, right? Because if you say it offensively, it's going to be received that way. You know, I had another friend that confronted me with something and I was okay with the confrontation, but then she started just digging the knife in. She was like, and you know, you always do this. It's your MO. It's your modus operandi. It's, the, it's your character. It's the way you act all the time. And you know, anytime somebody says all the time and whatever, and I was thinking, well, I was there for you here, and I was there for you there, and I was there for you there, and I was there for you there, you know, and then that's the wrong approach, right? But out of our pain, sometimes we say it wrong. So check your heart, check the timing, and, and, and then say it in love, amen? And be a good listener. Okay? You got to attack the issue and not each other. So good. Amen? So good. Awesome. I mean, there's like so much meat there. So, I mean, I could preach on it all year. I, I was like, I can't do this in 10 minutes, but I did. I looked at the This is just a little glimpse into the things that we'll be having to cover because God is going to deal with all of us on it. Um, I did want to just open the panel up real quick, but before we do, can you guys turn off these side, like, blue lights? They are for me, personally, I'm dying. Um, so, um, does anybody want to just maybe jump into what Dr. V was saying? I wanted to see if you guys had anything to respond with that. Well, actually, that's my part. Is I mean, she already referred to it, kind of the burrito wrap method, but um, yeah. so. Well, wait, let me ask you a question then. But So before we go to the burrito wrap method, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, there was a part of this where um, I think we were in our conversation talking about like when you confront somebody and their response is not godly. And then you go, what do I do at this point? Um, there are things to take into consideration like, they've grown up maybe differently or they see things or they're in a broken place and maybe they're not spiritually strong where you are at and you might be talking on different levels and just walk in love and just cover that and you may not be able to fix it because I've gone into things thinking this is the right thing to do and this is what God says and we're both Christians and then it doesn't turn out that way and I'm so disappointed I'm like what what happened it's like seriously the word doesn't work have you ever felt that way and so I'm just going to be real. And so I've had to learn, no, you did what the word told you to do, but how that person's responding is not your responsibility. And the reality is, is that God loves you too. So you're not a dumping ground from other people as well. That does not. And so I want to, I wanted to say that because for years I was a dumping ground to a relationship that was very unhealthy. And I was like, because it, it was codependency. We become codependent on people. And the reality is, is that God tells you to confront, tells you to keep things healthy, tells you to walk in love. But at some point, you are not someone's dumping ground. And it doesn't mean you're not walking in love with them or confronting an issue. If you go to them and say, hey, when you said this, this hurt my heart, and they don't want to receive it, then that's between them and the Lord, but you did your job before God and you went and you confronted the issue. And so I don't want there to be this condemnation on you of like, I tried and then they flipped out and I didn't know what to do. And like, no, release them, love them and move forward. Like you don't have to fix every problem. You can't fix everything. And I've learned that over seven years. You cannot fix everything. You are not God. Oh, praise Jesus for that. And so I just wanted to kind of give someone some freedom in that. Um, the other thing is like, uh, have really people in your life that you can be accountable to um, in these confrontational moments. Like I can, I remember, I'll never forget, I was struggling and going through a really hard time. And Julia was in my life at this, at this, well, Julia's my friend, but Julia came up to me. And she said, why do you feel that you need to react every time this person comes at you this way? And just the simple question of that, like, what, why am I reacting? I had to go and get with the Holy Spirit. And it was like six months of learning why I was reacting. And the Lord was taking me through a whole nother breaking free process of why 
I was reacting and how I don't need to react and I don't have to defend myself. God's my defender. And, and even if they say these things, I don't have to go to bat every time they say it. Let them think what they're going to think. But I know that before God, I walked in love and, and I tried my best to be as holy and pleasing to God in that relationship as I could. And I was just so grateful that I had someone in my life that could be honest with me and say, hey, why are you responding this way? And I didn't like that about myself already. We know what we don't like about ourselves, right? Like we know what we don't like about ourselves. But if you can allow yourself to receive from people that say, my mom will, my mom will say things to me that I'm like, whoa, that was, ugh, I don't like that. And then, but it's true and I need to work it out and I need to fix that about myself. So sometimes we don't confront because we don't trust ourselves, what we're, what we're going to say, what, how we're going to respond, because I don't respond well. I, don't, I know I'm, I'm triggered. I know I have these issues. I know I don't know how to confront these issues well. So sometimes you might be on the other end of that. Like, I know I'm unhealthy in some places, and that's okay to be there, guys. You need to own that so that you can heal from that and you can grow from that, because we're not all just these healthy people, right? When we meet Jesus, we're like, we're all fixed. No, it's a process. He's working it out in all of us. Nobody has come to the place of perfection, not one of us. And so that's where long suffering and grace comes in. And we say, hey, I don't think I handled this well. I think I could have done a better job at listening to you and hearing you. And maybe I over overlooked what you were saying because I was thinking about myself or I was worried about how my reaction would be. These are things that come with love. I had someone come to me recently. I don't even know if she's in the room, but I won't say who she is. And, um, and we had this meeting and I remember sitting down having this meeting and I'm like, what are we talking about? And I just loved her to death. And I just thought she's like the most amazing person in the world. And she's like, well, I'm offended by you. And I'm like, what? Have you ever been that person on the other? Why? <laughs> like, I love you. And so, and she was like, well, I'm coming to you in love because this is how I'm feeling. And now, I, my first just reaction is like, that's dumb because that's not true. You know, have you ever like that? Like, that is not, Satan is talking to you and that is not true. Um, and so Satan had been working working a number on her brain and on her mind that I was thinking things towards her that I was not even, I wasn't there at all. And, but because she came to me and was able to have a conversation with me about it and we did it with kindness and we were calm and everybody, I needed her to be able to say everything she was feeling, say it, just tell me what you're thinking. Okay, now please. And this is what I said, because even though I know that's not what I was thinking and even though I know that's not what I was wanting her to feel, I said, I am very sorry. I'm very sorry that you thought that and that you had to walk through that in your heart. I don't want that to be your truth because it's not true. I love you and I think of you this way. And sometimes Satan comes in and he will put thoughts into our mind. He will plant seeds of discord. And I'm so glad you came to me now that we can squash this. And this won't be something in the future that will take us down. And we have to work together. We're going to do this well. And I thought it was such a healthy conversation. Now we see each other. It's so fun. And it's so good to be around each other. But if she would not have come to me, right, I would have had no clue. Because I'm like, I'm in la-la land, just loving on her and thinking she's amazing. But she's thinking the opposite. See, Satan does that. And so you have to get past yourself. Sometimes it's not just because it's, sometimes you feel things or think things and know that's how it is, but you have to be right. Died, you, are, you have to be right. Maybe you were wrong. Maybe you judged that situation wrong. Maybe, and so go in with a humble heart. She went in going, this is how I'm feeling, but is it, is it true? And I was like, I loved that reaction because it was like, it gave me a chance to apologize to her, but at the same time also like, Tell her how amazing she was and how awesome God sees her. And so it was almost like the enemy didn't have room. Guys, when we go to each other and we have these conversations, the enemy doesn't get room anymore. And so try and do better. Can we do better in 2023? <laughs> at loving each other, at responding to the things. And, you know, and Dr. V, you're right. There are some things that you're like, that was so me. And they don't even know. And you can work that out, right? But like if you are still, if it still keeps coming up, that should be an understanding like, oh, this is something I need to bring to the light so Satan doesn't have room anymore in my head and in my heart. So if it's something that you're like, no, that was me, I was being dumb, and you can move forward and enjoy being around that person, it's not weird, cool. Like do that then. But if it just keeps coming up, then you probably need to 
Just go bring it to the light so Satan doesn't have room anymore. And listen, you're not always going to come to terms. Like how many times, mom, have we fought? And we're like, no. I love the last time we fought. We fought good. And when we fought, (laughs) I called her. I'm like, fine. I'm really sorry. She's like, listen, I'm right. You're right. We love each other. We're not going to apologize to each other for if we are right or wrong. We love each other. And I'm like, all right, I'm cool with that. Like, (laughs) because... She was right in what she was saying. I was right in what I was saying, but we were saying different things and we love each other and we're trying to build each other up, but we're coming at each other the wrong way. And it's more important for us to love each other and be real with each other, right? So you don't always have to be right. Can you say, I do not always have to be right? Okay, or somebody may see something from a different perspective and it doesn't mean that you're experience and that was deflated because of their perspective so just so you know don't let satan play toss and tennis ball with your brain and your heart let's bring it to the light and let's let god bring love on that and bring conflict into a good place okay next question pastor joanna cancel culture dun, 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 says to cut people out and cut people off How do we choose to love over judgment and avoid cutting people out of our lives? Well, um, I kind of looked up what's cancel culture. (laughs) So, you know, I wanted to, okay, what's in, okay. So it's a popular phrase right now. Have you guys heard about that, cancel culture? But anyway, so it says it's a, a phrase to a culture in which those who are deemed to have acted or spoken in an in acceptable manner, or ostracized, boycotted, or shunned, or like Pastor Jessica said, you just cut them off. You just cut them off. Like I'm not going to deal with that. Yeah. You know, they call I, it ghosted. Yeah, like, like you're yeah, ghosted. You're ghosted. Yeah. Like maybe you have a friend, you're texting, and all of a sudden they're not texting you anymore, or a boyfriend, or something like that. You know, <laughs> and then they're like, "What happened? What happened? You know, they they canceled you. You know? <laughs> you've been canceled. You didn't know it, but you were ghosted and canceled." <laughs> You may have learned something today. So, <laughs> so anyways, um, so this is something that we you hear about. You know, it's very political. Political could be in the political arena. It could be in the, the, the theater. Like, for instance, a couple of famous people, Will Smith, people have, have I'm not going to watch his movie. He slapped that guy. He's so rude, you know. Um, you guys know who Will Smith is? He's an actor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Elon Musk, I don't know if you guys know who that is, but, uh, you know, he's like, people are like, I don't like him. You know, he's a Tesla guy. That's the cars that run on him. Yeah, he bought, in, he bought um, Twitter. No, Twitter. And, yeah, and he told Trump, you could come back. And people are like, oh, we don't like you no more. And so, you know, so they've cut him off. They boycotted. They shunned. You know, and I got to confess that I almost canceled somebody this week. <laughs> And, okay, maybe some of you grandmas out there, I'm a new grandma. You know, I don't get to see my little grandbaby. All the, my granddaughter's three years old. She lives all the way in Germany. I don't get to see her very often. So I was FaceTiming the other day, and she did not want to talk to Nana. And my Nana heart got offended. And I'm like, I'm going to cancel you, girl. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, I'm going to go talk to Valentina. She will want me, Nana to hold her and kiss her. <laughs> My other granddaughter, okay. So okay. can you guys relate, you grandmas out there? So, but the Holy Spirit came upon me, and I repent, and I just said, okay. Instead of canceling her, I just pretend to cry that she didn't love Nana, and then she started laughing, and then everything was okay, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just trying to be a little bit funny there. But anyways, but really, how, I mean, it's kind of silly, but... To be honest, I did get a little offended because you know what? She was busy making her oma a little craft. Her oma is her German grandma. So right away, the flesh wants to, oh, you love that grandma. You don't love me. You get to spend all the time with that grandma and not me. And so it's like my flesh, you know, we got to get that flesh under control. Our flesh gets us in trouble. And I'm learning this even more, being a grandma, being a nana. But you know what? Um... God covers all. He chooses to, he, to teach us to love, not to judge. And on a more serious note, the Lord got a hold of me and taught me this tool when I was starting to go through restoration. And um, 
you know, over 20 years ago, you know, when I was going through restoration and dealing with my pride and in different areas, getting offended with my husband, with whoever, you know, there was a lot of things I had to work through. And um, I remember um, driving down the street in downtown Riverside, and the Lord had me look over because I felt him say, turn. And I turned, I saw a prostitute in the middle of the day at this bright, at this peak hotel that was there. It's not there anymore, downtown University and um, in Riverside. And he says, do you think you're better than her? And I said, um, yeah, of course, Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm way better. I, I, I'm a Christian. I love you. I serve you. He goes, do you think I love you more than I love her? And I'm like, well, yeah, because I'm better. I'm a Christian. I love you. I serve you. <laughs> and he says, then he scolded me. And he says, don't judge my daughter. He goes, I died for her just as much as I died for you. And he had to take me on a journey of knowing God's true love, his unconditional love, not the love that we are conditioned to, like, I like you, you like me, I'll be good to you, you be good to me. No, I judged her, and he knew it. He knew my heart. It was wicked and it was sinful, but yet I thought I was all right, I was good, because I, I kept my commandments. I kept the commandments. I didn't steal, I didn't kill, I didn't do drugs, I did no but I didn't know how to love like God had called me to love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. And, in, in, um, and that's in 1 Peter 4, 8. And in Matthew chapter 7, 1, it says, what does it say? Judge not. judge not that you not be judged. For with that judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with that measure you will be, you will use it, you will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do you not consider the pank in your own eye? Uh -huh. Oh, how can you say to your brother, let, not, let me remove this speck from your, your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And that's what God told me. He said, he gave me a commandment, he said, you don't know what she's been through. Just like what Dr. Vanessa says, you know? You have to think about what have they been through. You need to go. She doesn't know I love her. You need to go and tell her that I love her. And I had to go on a mission. And I went to that hotel. And for, for a couple of years there, I did ministry there. And I shared with the prostitutes. I gave them tortillas and oranges and bread or whatever I could do to get my foot in the door. And God had to take me on a journey, had to love unconditionally and not cancel people out like, oh, I'm not going to go talk to her because she's trying to seduce my, my husband. She's trying to seduce my brothers. She's trying to seduce. No, I had to look at her through the eyes of God and show love unconditionally and remember that God loved her just as much as he loved me. God died for for her, just as much as he died for my sins, which were just as wicked. But yet I thought I was better. How many of you kind of think, yeah, I'm better that, than that person? Yeah, but be honest with yourself. I had to be honest with myself. How many people have you canceled? Not because they, you know, because, you know, you, no, just because you don't, you're sick of them. You don't want, you're offended with them. Like, you know, we, this all happens through offenses. We get offended. Well, we got to let it go. We got to forgive. And I know we said that already, but it's so true. We got to walk in God's love, his grace, his mercies are new every morning, not just for you, but for that prostitute on the street. Amen. Not for, just for you, but for that drug addict, that homeless person. Do you look at them and think you're better? God looks at them and he loves them just as much as he loves you. So I'm here to remind you to love as God has called you to love. Don't cancel the culture. Don't cancel people. Love them to life as God has called us to love them to life. So good. So good. I love what your, your story is because, I mean, how many times have we maybe heard something 
And it reminds me of the story, Tracy, where you were asking God to, to do something with you, and he sent you to that homeless man on State Street that one day. You know, if you will allow yourself to let the Holy Spirit interrupt your day, you will see God's love throughout the day. Yesterday I had this experience. Dan and I went to go eat last minute. He, he's on this, like, weird fast. And um, so I'm kind of, I guess, following him because we're married. It's kind of annoying because that's not my fast. So I'm, <laughs> But I have to kind of do things with him. So we have to eat specific food. So we're at this weird, weird restaurant. And the people behind him are, like, three ladies, and they are talking about their drunken endeavors. And it was so um, detestable to my spirit man. I was like, ew. Because I, I remember that life. And I was like, you know, you know when you come from something, you're like, mm. And I was like, look at these raunchy women. Raunchy. And I just was like, I was. And, and Dan, Dan's not even paying attention. He's like working on his phone. And I'm like, so I'm stuck listening to their stupid conversation. And I'm just like, this is crazy that these people live, they're old. You should not be old acting like this. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, because seriously, I'm just like, old people need to stop acting stupid like teenagers. Like, I mean, all these thoughts, okay, confessions of a pastor are going through my head. And as I walked out, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, you know I love them. And I was like, oh, God, I totally failed at this. Like, you know, like, and... And it was like, and I had to pray for them, that they would find a way out of that, obviously, pattern that they had for themselves in their lives. And, and so you can be on mission wherever you're at. And when you find your spirit man kind of bugged, like you did and like I did, ask the Holy Spirit, what do I need to do? Maybe he's going to ask you to pray. Maybe he's going to ask you to bring him tortillas and minister to them. Maybe he's going to ask you to go out of your way, be open to be interrupted this year because we're going to do better at loving people. And that goes for me too. And so I just want to say we're all in this together. Okay. Nobody's perfect on this, but Pastor Joanna, thank you for sharing that story with us. And let's do a good job at not canceling, cutting people off, you know? Um, and then if you've been somebody who has been cut off, that's hard on the other end. I've been that, that person many, many times, and you don't know what you've done. And, you know, you have to just choose in your heart to walk in love and not hold an offense for being cut off. So there's, like, the other side to that. Like, if you've been on the other end of that cancel culture part, yes, maybe you did something. But if they didn't come to you and talk to you about it, you just have to trust that God is going to work that out in you and that ask the Holy Spirit to work things out in you. And I do want to say this. People can change. Like, I'm serious. People can change because when we get a hold of the word of God, when we get a hold of the Holy Spirit, God begins to change us and mold us into who he needs us to be and not what our flesh and our character, sin nature wants to be. And so when we come under the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do this. We can be better at whatever. So maybe you've been judged off of the old man and you are becoming a new man. And, you know, there's somebody in my life that I pray for every single day. And um, this person is young, very, very young. And they, I know, are not going to be, when I meet them again, because right now I'm not in their world, but when I meet them one day, I just know I'm going to meet them one day again. They're not going to be that person I remember them to be. What, number one, I believe that my prayers are working in their life. I do. I really believe that God has given me an assignment to pray. And as I pray, I'm praying things over these people. And they may never know that I'm praying this over them. But I'm, I know God can change this person. And so I'm expecting to see, like, this awesome young woman of God doing powerful things for him one day. Because that's who I believe God made them to be. And so instead of being mad that you were canceled or mad that you, you know, they offended you or did something stupid to you, go into prayer and begin to, what do I need to do as a woman of God? And how do I need to respond to the pain and the hurt maybe they've caused? But I can respond to it with love and with grace and with acceptance and mercy. So anyways, those are maybe re reactive ways to respond to really hard places. So Pastor Sue, um, let's do this. Some people have strong personalities. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Speak to me, oh, wise one. Can you share how to go about confronting in love using the burrito or sandwich method. 
Okay, I feel like I have the very practical piece, but um, uh, yeah, years and years ago when we first came to The Rock and we were developing the children's ministry and establishing policies and procedures and all that, um, in the world of children's ministry, you do have to say no sometimes, and that was really tough because even then, almost 30 years ago, people didn't like hearing the word no right? Especially when it comes to their children, you know, just admit it. We don't like to hear that word. But anyway, so um, I don't know where my husband and I picked it up along the way, but uh, what we adopted and trained our workers to do, and it's just a part of my life now, is what we call, what we call the sandwich method. And you could call it a breed or wrap if you want, if you, that's your preference. But it's basically... When there is something a little bit difficult that you have to communicate, sandwiching it with something positive or like we would say praise, um, negative, praise, correction, praise is what we would uh, train our workers. And it's just to think if you have to say, like sometimes it's just little day to day. And sometimes, especially if you have kind of a strong personality or you tend to be more that what we call around here prophet perceiver, like you just see something that's wrong and you just want to nail it, you know. Um, people don't want always for you to just nail it and be so maybe strongly opinionated about everything in your world. So just having an attitude that if I have to communicate something a little bit difficult or corrective by nature, I am going to sandwich it with a lot of praise. And most people can receive correction if they feel like you're coming to them in love. And so what I, sometimes you have to dig down deep, but you find something that you can express that express admiration or, you know, her shoes. I mean, you know, you, you pull deep within you something that you can say that's of a positive and praiseworthy uh, manner toward that person, and then you administer the little bit of correction or whatever you have to say, and then you couple it again with something very positive or, or um, uh, praiseworthy toward them. In Ephesians 4.15, it says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. We're to speak the truth in love. And people have to know that, our mo that we're motivated by love. And it's a good check system on you, too. That are, am I really being motivated by love? Do I just want to correct this wrong thing you said? Or, or, or do I w really care that you get it and don't just get defensive. If you just tell somebody, like, and this is so important with parents with teenagers, parents with young adults, um, grandparents that you're seeing your children parent, and you just want to go in there and say, are you kidding me? You just let her pick up her binky off the ground and put it back in her mouth? I sterilized it for five minutes. Everything. No, I mean, whatever it is, you can't just go into the situation and just be so um, strongly opinionated about everything. Or you, what you're going to do is you're going to put up, they're going to put up walls and get defensive, and then you've shut down communication. And on a day to day, we want to communicate. We want to be able to get along and enjoy one another. Amen? I love what Pastor Deborah taught us years ago. You're entitled to your opinion, but you're not always entitled to express it. And so, so that's a check system, too. Is it really uh, something that's detrimental, or is it just kind of your opinion? You know, I, well, I won't go there. But anyway, <laughs> second, <clears throat> second Timothy 2, 23. That was just a, well, maybe I will go there. Just a carnal, left-sided thing, right side, left-sided thing. You know, we all have a, we all have a style, right? We, some of us are kind of in style with the current trends, or we're not. And I... I, I just find it in, interesting at this season of my life. I know what decade you did high school. 
I do. I know what decade you did high school because many times that's where your default is. That's what the kind of clothes you're comfortable with, the kind of hairstyle you're comfortable, comfortable with. And when you've been on the planet for 70 years, I've seen every style, so I'm totally confused. I don't know. But, <laughs> but I do have to say I'm most comfortable in my hippie clothes if I, can, if I have any. But anyway, in 2 Timothy, that was just sidebar. No value in that at all. 2 Timothy 2 verse 23 it says, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Avoid them. Foolish and ignorant disputes about tastes and food or, or vitamins or, you know, knowing that they generate strife. It says in verse 24, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. That's someone that's been offended. So you do need to bring humble correction, but in a way that people can receive it. So the sandwich method, as I said, is basically positive or praise, correction or whatever's negative, and then, um, and then sandwiched again with praise or something positive. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. If you get this method of communication in the back of your mind, it will help you to be slower to speak because you're having to stop and say, what can I say positive about this person? Now, in children's ministry, how it translated is many times like you might be the lead teacher in that class and Johnny that came for the first time was hitting everybody and having a fit and, and disrupting the whole class. So some kind of way you want to communicate to that parent or may feel like you need to, whatever the behavior was, but you want that parent to continue to come to church. Johnny needs to be in class, even though Johnny tore everything up. Are you, do you understand what I'm saying? So it was, we would have to work with training, like as the parent comes to the door and they're here to pick up Johnny, that you would say, I am so blessed that you came to church today. Did you get something out of the message? Oh, yeah, it was so good. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, did, did Johnny have a bad morning? Was he? Oh, yeah, he, you know, had a fit, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, I just wanted to communicate, you know, that, he, you know, we had some challenging moments with Johnny, but do not get me wrong. We're so glad he, he, he's here. The more you bring Johnny, the more he's going to learn the word of God, the more we're here to come alongside you and help you parent, and it's all good. So see, that was a way that the parent knew, okay, Johnny kind of acted out, and maybe there's some behavior they need to focus on at home, but yet they could receive it. And so they leave with a smile, you're smiling, and it's all good. Are you, are you with me? And I've shared this before in Australia. They have horrible customer service. Horrible customer service. But they say no with a smile. And so you walk away smiling and you're going, they just told me no. They didn't take my bags to my room. They didn't bring me another cup of tea, a glass of tea. No, they're just, but they're smiling and we're all good. So um, they really are. They really are. Um, if you have to confront something serious in a close friend's life that you feel like there's an intervention needs to go on here or some of the things that Dr. V talked about, we've all been talking about, then you have to pray. That's why it says, be swift to hear, slow to speak. And you pray, Colossians 4, 3, that God open a door of utterance. If you really care that that the person's eyes be open or that they have the word of God spoken into their heart in such a way that they can receive it and not just get defensive. You've got to give time for the Holy Spirit to work. And so many times when you've set yourself, I'm just going to pray for my friend. I'm going to pray and let God show me if he wants me to say something or if he's just going to show her and she's going to open up about it. You have to season that with prayer because otherwise you won't build a godly friendship. See, a godly friendship requires the word of God many times coming into that friendship. It's not a carnal friendship. It's not just you like the same, you know, clothes or you go to the same kind of movies or you have the same habits. There's something there that is godly that you want to help bring out in each other. So there will be some times 
of confrontation. And yet, if you will take the time to pray about it and let God open up the situation, open up the door, many times they'll come to you and say, I've just been feeling this. And then you know, door of utterance. Okay, now I can speak into their life because they're now coming to me. And, and there's an, an attitude of humility. I love uh, Pastor Teresa taught us this at the rally. She said, um, there's a way to say no without saying no. And we actually use it in our preschool classes in a lot of areas. But many times you have to, like, just if you're in charge of something or you're you know, involved in, in any arena at work or wherever, and you do have to give a no, but you're, you feel like the person won't receive Rather than give them a no, you tell them, well, I don't know, I don't think we can do that, but we can do this. So you give them a no really by redirecting them to what you can do. You don't kind of let that word no come out of your mouth, because again, in our culture that we're trying not to cancel, um, <laughs> no one likes the word no, but you say, well, I don't, we can't do that, but we can do this, and you give them that option kind of like my daughter does with her girl with her girls you can't you can wear this outfit or this outfit <laughs> anyway and then another point of wisdom proverbs 18:13 says he who answers a matter before he hears it it is folly and shame to him brother hagen at rama used to say if you answer a matter before you hear it you're a fool and we've adopted that that in our our, our spiritual guidance around here we when we're you know, meeting with a married couple or sometimes the guy won't come in so you're only talking to the wife. You have to always remember there's two sides to every story. We were talking to a couple last night and when he told the story, man, it sure looked one way. When she told the story, it was exactly the opposite. And in that moment, we couldn't say, he's right, you're right. It was, God, what are you saying? There's there's two sides to every story, and then there's God's side. And so that's why in communication, we have to be aware of that. What your friend might be telling you in their relationship with their husband or whatever, that's her perception. And Pastor Deborah has also taught us we don't see as things are. We see things as we are. And those were some of the pointers that Dr. B gave us. We have to realize we're broken. We're living with broken people. And perception is like 99% of the issue many times. And so we, we, you know, when you're talking to someone or you feel like there is something negative you have to confront, ask questions. Let them explain their life. Let them explain the situation. And so many times when you hear what they have to say about it, you realize that there's a, a real brokenness going on or there's obviously some information you did not have. And then you can either confront with a, a lot more wisdom or, you know, just to take it to prayer. So, so good. I'm still trying to figure out the burrito. Like the sandwich I get, but the burrito, so do you just like explain that really quick? Is oh, it's just like saying the truth in love. So okay. truth is in the middle. Okay. In, I mean, the, the truth, the hard thing, and you wrap it up in love in a tortilla in a yeah i'm hungry and you know one way one thing is to give a compliment to somebody but when you're confronting somebody in a hard thing you know what's good to do is to point out one of your weaknesses first so if i have something to say to you and i say and it's my friend i'm like girl you know i am the worst this or you know i have a problem with my temper or with this and you know but I just want to you know we all have all these things going on but what happened this day you know start with I'm not perfect you know look at me that's kind of like yeah you are like that whatever and then because if they chose to be defensive and come back with you you've already said it you know it's a good one because they'd be like well you're and you'd be like yeah I already admitted that I am that way I'm working on God's working on me but what we're dealing with right now is this issue right here you know that's good that's good we're giving you strategy <laughs> You're all going to walk out of here doing it to each other, and they're going to be like, that's a sandwich method. Don't be sandwich method in me. <laughs> that's so funny. Okay, so Pastor Tracy, you have one last one, and then we're going to have you guys go to your tables. What do you do if the one that, the one, if you're the one 
offended or feel like someone might be offended with you. So these were all examples of um, what happens when your, your feelings are hurt. But what if you're the one and you realize you hurt someone else? So let's see what the scripture says. Let's look at Matthew. We're just going to read a lot of scripture because the Bible is pretty clear about this. This is Matthew 5, 23 through 26. Let's just read it together. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Next verse. Leave your gift there before the altar. And go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. And I think of praise and worship. We're bringing our gift, our sacrifice of praise to the Lord. And it's almost like the Lord is stopping us at the door of the sanctuary. Stop! Don't go further. First, turn around. Go. Make, work it out with your friend. Come next service. Then bring your praise and worship to the Lord. Amen. So verse 25 Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. There's some consequences if you don't work some things out quickly. Verse 26, and this is Jesus talking. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And this is... Uh, you know, just take it this way. There's going to be some consequences if I don't work this out. We have an accuser of the brethren who is very willing and ready to steal, kill, and destroy if he has permission. Bringing, um, okay, so we talked about what bringing our gift to the altar is. Let's not try and do something for the Lord. And God's like, don't even, wait, stop. First, go and repair this, this relationship. Um, In the church at Corinth, there were some really offensive things happening. They were hurting each other. Let's look at this, 1 Corinthians 11. For in eating, they're they're having the Lord's Supper. There's bread and wine. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and the other is drunk. So the people, have you ever been to a potluck? And everyone's like, I got to be first in line. You know, there's that like, oh, I'm going to be first because by the time I'm in the back, everything's gone. All the tamales are gone, right? <laughs> well, in Corinth, it was even worse. Verse 22, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in or do you despise the church of God? They were despising the church of God because they were going in and stuff in their face and not leaving enough for other people. And shame those who have nothing. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you with this? I do not praise you. Let's skip down to verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself. He explains, not discerning the Lord's body. They were mistreating that bread and treating it like it was just regular, you know, like it was common. But they were also not discerning the Lord's body. We are the body of Christ. They weren't saying, you know, we need to hold that bread and say, this is precious. This represents the blood and the body of Jesus. It's holy. This is the Lord's. But we have to have that same attitude about this body of Christ. It's precious. It's holy. I have to honor the body. Otherwise, we're taking communion in an un worthy manner. Have you ever been in a communion service where before you partake, you go and work out an issue. If you, you, you cross the room and you talk to someone and you say, I think there might be something between us. I've been in a couple like that. And it's beautiful. The Lord is saying, communion is, uh, is about unity in the body. Let's keep reading. Paul, the apostle Paul is not done. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. They die. This is so crucial. Like, there's few topics more important than this in the Word of God than Christian unity. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. He brings consequences. When we're not working it out with each other, we might experience some consequences so we don't lose our salvation and end up with the world. Is that making sense? Now, correct me if I'm, not, if I'm not explaining this right. Let's keep going. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. 
But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. <laughs> Lest you come together. For, don't come hangry, okay? <laughs> right? Lest you come together for what? Judgment. If we don't do this right, we are under judgment. I can't think of anything more serious than this on this while we're still earth side than being right with each other. And the rest I will set in order when I come. So what are the consequences when we're not right with someone? If you know someone has something against you, you hurt their feelings. Well, it was an accident. I wasn't trying to. You better go. Don't even serve the Lord. Leave your gift at the altar. Go fix that thing. Or judgment will be upon you. Is this too harsh? Is, is the Apostle Paul exaggerating? Okay. What did Jesus say? Jesus didn't just say, you won't leave until you paid the last penny. He said, assuredly, the living word of God had to say, assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Jesus was very serious, very serious. When I was studying this, I was like, oh, Lord, I have to do the hard one. But no, each one has been very, very heavy, right? Jesus was saying, in other words, I really mean it. Let's look at Acts 9, 5. Lord Jesus appears to Saul. This is the Apostle Paul before he gets saved. He's, he's persecuting Christians. He's taking people like me and you and taking us to jail, taking our dad to jail, taking our uncle to jail. And he knocks him down and appears to him. Who are you, Lord? Saul asks. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Oh, wait, I thought he was persecuting the Christians. Jesus says, that's me. That's my body. If you touch other Christians, it's like you're doing it to me. Is Jesus saying to us, I am Jesus who you're shunning. I'm Jesus who you're throwing an attitude to. See, if you, if you mistreat another Christian, Jesus is like, oh, don't do that to me. Okay, I am Jesus whom you are looking down on. I am Jesus who you are ignoring. Ignoring, it's, you know, I've heard so many people, oh, I don't fight with her. I just, you know, I just don't say anything. Just like we were saying, it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Mm. Even the tax collectors say hello to their friends. But can you say hello to something you have an issue with, to someone you, you have trouble with? So let's just read one more scripture. I know we're going over, to, over time here, but let's just read one more. These, this is Jesus again, Luke 17, 1 through 4. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Hello, we're in this broken world. Okay, <laughs> I had a friend who, used, who was so offensive, he was so rude, and he would be like, Jesus said offenses, it's impossible, offenses would come. But he forgot the next part. But woe to him <laughs> when the living word of God says, whoa, he sees, he saw the devil cast down. He sees in the spirit. He sees history. And when Jesus says, whoa, to that person, I think he knows what he's talking about. Some translations say how terrible it will be for that person. Others say what sorrow awaits that person. Woe to him through whom they come. You do not want to be the person who is bringing the offense. Trust me. Verse 2, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than he should offend these little ones. Take heed to yourself. Now, he, now, now, in case some of us are like, well, they know that they hurt my feelings. They need to come to me. You see, the Bible says they have to come to me. Leave your gift at the altar and come work it out with me. Let's listen. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So who's the responsibility on? The person who, who hurt you or the person who feels hurt? Who should go to who? Both. Both. God is like, meet, you, you should be meeting each other. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So the Lord is really serious about us getting along working things out and forgiving each other. Amen. Good. So fun. Aren't you glad you came to Women Rock AM?